Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Uh, welcome all of you, I am going to be talking to you over the next 40 odd lectures on plant wide control of chemical processes. Uh, today I am going to walk you over, I am going to introduce the course to you, uh, that is what I call module 0 which is introduction to the course. Uh, by the way most of this course will be powerpoint presentations uh, and maybe some video modules on uh, use of commercial simulators such as Aspen, Hisis and Unisim for doing uh, uh, dynamic simulations of complex chemical processes. Uh, chemical process operation, you would have seen um, all those who are chemical engineers, any process has some key production objectives. Uh, you want to produce chemicals in bulk and run the process such that the process operation is safe, also the process is operated in a stable manner. And last but not least, uh, the way you run the process should be such that you make profit. So, economics, you want, so the key production objectives in chemical process operation are safety, stability and good economics. And these economic objectives are typically stated in terms of the production rate, how much of crude oil for example, you want to process per day that depends on market demand. What is the quality of the product that you that, that the market requires? And these days uh, because of environmental considerations, your process should also be operated in a way such that everything that is being released into the environment uh, meets uh, regulations in terms of effluent specifications, so that you do not pollute. Now, we continuous processes as is typical of chemical processes are typically operated to meet in a continuous manner to meet these production objectives 24 7 that means 24 hours a day 7 days a week non-stop. So, we would like to meet our key production objectives in terms of safety, stability and economics through and through all the time. Now, as you may appreciate because of changing economic conditions the production objective itself can change. For example, in winter season a refinery may be required to produce more of heating oil, whereas in summer months it may be required to produce more of gasoline. The production objective itself can change. Uh, secondly, there are ever present process disturbances and just to give you the different types of disturbances that are there in a process, the ambient conditions change. For example, the diurnal cycle days are hot, afternoons are hot, nights are cool. Seasonal variations, for example, rainy season your cooling towers would not be as efficient as in the summer season as, as in the dry seasons. Uh, the raw material quality itself can change. For example, a refinery is supposed to process crudes from uh, crudes from different, uh, different sources. So, you will have uh, light crude, you will have sour crude you know and so on so forth the same process is supposed to process raw materials of you know a very large span in quality. Then you have got sensors that are telling you for example, temperatures, pressures and flows that are telling you the health of the process. These sensors itself are noisy, they can drift and finally, you have you know the, your process itself slowly changes. For example, when a process is started up with new catalyst, the catalyst is new slowly over time it sinters or it loses its activity. So, the catalyst uh, loses its activity uh, over 6 months or a year of operation. Similarly, you may have a new heat exchanger that has been cleaned up, but due to sustained process operation continuous process operation it slowly gets fouled up and so on so forth. So, the equipment characteristics themselves change over time. So, we would like to operate a, a continuous process plant to meet key production objectives. We would like to operate our process to meet the key production objectives 
even as the production objective itself can change and in the presence of ever present disturbances. Now, the key problem in process operation is there is ever present variability due to disturbances, production rate changes and so on and so forth. What we would like to do is we would like to transform this variability to benign locations in the plant. Now, one way of looking at a control system is as this agent of transformation of transformation or management of process variability and just to just to illustrate the point I am going to take a very simple example. Here is a heat exchanger you have got a process stream that is coming in and a process stream it is uh, this process stream gets heated uh, to a certain temperature and the heating medium is steam. Okay. Now, if the steam flow is kept constant then because the flow rate of the process stream in and or the temperature of the process stream in itself changes what you will have is that the temperature of the process stream out would show variability and this variability is shown here all right so what you have is the steam flow is constant as shown here the steam flow is constant whereas the process stream temperature is showing variability okay now let us say this process stream is being sent to a reactor this variability in the temperature is not acceptable since this process stream is going to go into a reactor so what we do is we put in a temperature controller and here is the temperature controller what this temperature controller is uh, is doing is measuring the temperature and if it is not at the set point it is adjusting the steam flow rate. So, thus, if the temperature is more than the set point, the steam flow rate would be reduced. If the temperature is less than the set point, the steam flow rate would be increased. Now, if this temperature loop is tuned properly, what you would have in this situation where there is feedback control is, the steam would go all over the place as you can see here, whereas the variability in the temperature is much less. So, what the control loop has done is transform the variability from the process stream to the steam flow. The variability in the temperature in the process stream was not acceptable or not desirable. The control system has transformed it to a location in the plant where it is acceptable to a benign location. Okay. So, this is a very simple way of looking at uh, chemical processes or control systems. In, in the sense that they are merely managing the ever present process variability by transforming it from undesirable locations to locations where it is acceptable to have that variability. Now, a chemical process is a series of interconnected units. For example, any process will have a reaction section uh, and then, then the reactor effluent which is a mixture of products and unreacted reactants would be taken to a separation section where the reactants will be separated from the products and since the reactants are expensive you will have these reactants being recycled back to the reaction section. So, you have material as well as energy recycle this is very typical of chemical processes and because of these interconnections manipulating a process stream disturbs the connected units. We also have material or energy recycle and therefore, this recycle may pro propagate the variability through the entire plant and just to illustrate this point maybe I should just take a small example. So, suppose you have got a reactor which feeds a distillation column please forgive my drawing that is why I resort to these powerpoint presentations because my drawing and handwriting are not that good in fact, they are pathetic, but in the computer age I guess it does not matter. So, here is a process and you are putting in fresh A and fresh B and in the reactor what happens is A plus B A reacts with B to give you C all right. The, the reaction does not go to completion in the reactor. So, the effluent from the reactor is a mixture of A, B and C. This mixture is sent to a distillation column C being heavy comes down the bottoms of this distillation column and the unreacted A and B come up the top A plus B. Since these are reactants and reactants are expensive it does not make sense to throw it. So, what we do is we recycle it back 
we recycle it back to the reactor. Now, the point that I am trying to make is the following. I would like for example, to control the reactor level tightly, because residence time in the reactor is going to affect the conversion. So, to hold the conversion constant, I would like to hold the level inside the CSTR constant. Let us say I am doing that uh, using a level controller and this level controller is indicated here. Okay. Now, as I adjust the variability in the level is now getting transformed to the flow to the distillation column. So, now in order to hold the level constant, I am disturbing the column. So, whatever I do in a loop, whatever I do in a control loop to hold something constant, to hold that constant, the variability gets transformed elsewhere. And because of these interconnections, for example, holding the level constant in the reactor disturbs the distillation column. Now, the distillation column is feeding back to the reactor, the unreacted reactants. That in turn will, so holding the level constant disturbs the column, whatever you do to hold the column where you, where it is supposed to be held is going to disturb back your reactor. Okay. So, the whole point is that this recycle may propagate the variability through the entire plant. You may think that you are only doing whatever you are doing to hold the reactor constant, but just to, to hold the reactor level constant, but just holding the reactor level constant may cause variability to go through the entire plant, may cause the whole plant to oscillate. Okay. So, that is the point that I was trying to make that recycle material and or energy can propagate process variability through the entire process. Okay. So, the key control system design questions are what process variables should we control? You see tight control is not always good, because if you control something tightly that means you are disturbing something else probably more than you should. Okay. What manipulation handles to use? Going back to the same reactor example, I was uh, using the reactor effluent flow to control the reactor level. I could have used the, in, the inlet flow to the reactor also to control the level. So, what manipulation handles to use and what should be the degree of tightness of control? These are key control system design questions, which hopefully once you have gone through the course, you should be able to do regardless of how complex the plant uh, looks at first sight. Okay. And in order to address these key control system design questions, uh, the one thing that one has to keep in mind always is plant wide propagation of variability. It may appeal, it is not always good to control everything very tightly and hopefully we will we will learn how and why etcetera, etcetera. The objective of this course is to give you an engineering common sense approach for designing effective plant wide control structures for chemical processes, which will have material and energy recycle and which is which causes certain complexities, which we will realize. Okay. So, this is the course objective and I think in my personal opinion, uh, this is actually very useful for anyone who is either working in the industry right now or who uh, would like to work in the core chemical industry as a career option. Uh, just to give you an example of chemical processes, here is an example process for cumin manufacturing, it is slightly simplified. So, what you have is, what you have is propylene and benzene being preheated, vaporized and then heated to the reaction temperature which would be say around 350 degree Celsius in a furnace. The benzene is also being mixed with unreacted benzene which comes which is being recycled. Okay. The heated reaction mixture is sent to a reactor. Now, this the when benzene reacts with propylene it is called an alkyl, it is essentially Friedel Crafts alkylation. Uh, the reaction is highly exothermic and the adiabatic temperature rise can be of the order of 200 degrees Celsius. Now, if the inlet temperature is 350 and the catalyst temperature, if you if you operate the reactor adiabatically, what will happen is uh, your catalyst, uh, your temperature towards the end of the reactor or towards the middle of the reactor may actually shoot up to 500-600 degrees Celsius. Therefore, what we have is the reactor is a shell and tube heat exchanger with catalyst loaded tubes and you got pressurized water circulating on the shell side 
okay. The flow rate of this water is very high, so the temperature rise on the shell side of the water would be very small. So, the, so the tubes essentially see a constant shell side temperature. Now, the circulating water recovers heat from the reactor from the hot tubes and this the hot uh, the hot water comes to this flash drum where because the pressure is low it 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 flashes to give you steam so you've got steam coming out here and because you're losing steam uh, there is some makeup water in order to keep this boiler you know to, in order to ensure that the boiler is always there is always water supply to the reactor the reactor effluent is cooled in a cooler and then sent to a to essentially a light out first distillation train. Uh, light out first means in the first column you will take out the lightest component, then whatever is left in the second column you will take out the next lightest component and so on and so forth. So, the in the first column you recover any unreacted propylene which is light along with inert propane that may be entering with the propylene. In the bottoms what you get are unreacted benzene, some of the product cumene and actually the cumene can also further alkylate with the with the propylene to give diisopropyl benzene. So, let, let me just clarify that. So, what you have is benzene C 6 H 6 this reacts with propylene, uh, propylene would be what C 2 H 4 no C 3 H 6 and this gives you cum cumene and cumene would be C 9 H 12. This is the main reaction. What happens is this cumene that has been formed can further alkylate with the propylene to give what is called diisopropyl benzene. Uh, diisopropyl benzene would be C 12 H 18. I think I think I am okay here. So, this is cumene which is your main product and this is diisopropyl benzene which is your side product. Now, you would like it is the cumene that is going to fetch you the profits. So, you would like to operate your plant your reactor such that most of the benzene goes to cumene and very little diisopropyl benzene gets formed because diisopropyl benzene is something that you cannot sell in the market from your kinetics etcetera you would know that what that essentially requires is that you run the reactor in an excess benzene environment. So, if you got excess benzene propylene would be limiting okay, and therefore, there will be a deficiency overall deficiency of propylene in the in the reactor uh, which would suppress the side reaction. Okay. So, the chemistry of the reaction dictates how you should be operating the reactor. So, this is the reaction scheme uh, coming back so, this is the reactor, the reactor effluent is cooled, the uncondensables do not condense, the benzene, the diisopropylene and the cumene they actually liquefy. This is sent to a light out first distillation train, in the first column you take out the unreacted any any amount of unreacted uh, propylene out the top along with inert propane. You see propane and propylene are close boiling, so you will never get pure propylene, you will get propylene with some amount of uh, n, uh, n propane inert propane. So, that inert propane and unreacted propylene goes up the top. The bottoms would be I think it would be C 6 benzene cumene C 9 and C 12. Okay. This bottoms is then sent to the next column and this is called the recycle column. Here what you do is you take out C 6 up the top which is the lightest component and down the bottoms what you take out is C 9 and C 12. Okay. The bottoms uh, the, the distillate is which is unreacted benzene is recycled back. The bottoms is sent to a second uh, to a, the third column which recovers C 9 up the top and the diisopropyl benzene down the bottoms. Okay. So, this is a simplified process for cumene manufacture in real processes what you have is you will also take this diisopropyl benzene and, and send it to a what is called a trans alkylator and there you further the diisopropyl benzene is converted back to cumene, okay. but that is besides the point. The point that I am trying to make is this process looks complicated to begin with. Okay. 
how do you design a control system for this process? What are the typical disturbances that this process is supposed to handle? One of the most common disturbances is throughput change. What is a throughput change? A throughput change is uh, imagine a car, you are driving a car. You would like to adjust your speed depending on traffic conditions and depending on how fast you want to get to the de destination. So, you would like to, so that is done by using the accelerator. Okay. Similarly, in a in a process, in a chemical process, the market condition dictates how much or how much production, how much cumin should be produced. Okay. So, a production rate change depending on market conditions is one of the most uh, is probably the most prevalent a uh, throughput change is what it is called is probably the most common load change uh, or disturbance that a control system should handle. For this process for example, the propylene which is coming from upstream it has got some impurity in the say it has got some n propane in it inert propane. The composition of this stream may change because of upstream upsets. Other disturbances uh, you got steam coming to the reboiler, this steam is being supplied by a boiler house or a you know a steam plant. The boiler in that steam plant can go through pressure surges or under surges. Okay. So, the pressure there may fluctuate and so on and so forth. So, there are all these disturbances and in spite of these disturbances you would like to process whatever is the market demand and you would like to produce cumin of the desired purity all the time. Okay. So, how do you design a control system? What are the issues in designing a control system? So, that so that despite the disturbances you can you can meet the production objective all the time always. In order to be able to design an effective control system you would need some controls fundamentals you know not too complicated, but you know PI controllers how do you tune them. Uh, what type of a controller should you have and so on and so forth. So, very basic essential process control fundamentals. Then what we will do is uh, we will go on to looking at controls of common unit operations in chemical processes and these common unit operations for example, are distillation, uh, distillation columns. Uh, distillation is the most widely used separation, it is the separation process of choice and separation is very common uh, is, is required in a chemical process because you may want to purify the raw material and of course, you want to purify your product. Okay. Uh, reactors which are the heart of any plant where you produce the value added chemical, heat exchangers and heat exchangers can be a uh, utility to process stream or process stream to process stream type of heat exchanges and then uh, miscellaneous systems for example, refrigeration systems, uh, steam plants and so on and so forth. Uh, after going over the unit controls then we will go to do plant wide uh, to cover plant wide control fundamentals. What are the issues in designing a plant wide control system? These issues I have just highlighted a little bit, but I do not think if I expand on it you will understand much, but nevertheless component inventories, reaction separation interaction, a common sensical design procedure. You see not a lot of mathematics just pure engineering common sense to design an effective control system. Then we will go through case studies and an example case study would be the cumin process that I just showed you uh, a slide earlier. Uh, then we will also cover throughput maximization. What do you mean by throughput maximization? See for continuous processes typically the margins are very low. Okay. So, the profit is driven by volumes, what, what does it mean volumes? Uh, well, to give you a very common sense cocaine, cocaine is a very uh, you know it, it, it the premium on that is very high you can sell maybe a kg of co cocaine for maybe 1 crore or 2 crores. Okay. On the other hand in a refinery your crude is costing you 55 dollars a barrel or 70 dollars a barrel, your refined product per barrel may be six, uh, you know just 5 dollars more. So, the margins are very small. So, when the margins are very small the way to maximize your profit is to maximize your throughput, the more you produce the more profit you make. So, in many continuous processes throughput maximization is equivalent to maximizing profit. Now, since you now a control system a plant wide control system can significantly affect the maximum achievable throughput in a process. 
So, the next issue is how do you design a plant wide control system such that it maximizes your throughput. Okay. So, we will also cover throughput maximization which is actually a very uh, of much practical interest in operating plants. The highlight of this course is we will have extensive simulation exercises on HISIS and Aspen plus uh, now HISIS has been bought by Aspen. So, it is essentially Aspen tech. These uh, exercises will be uh, available as supplementary modules which I which will develop over time. That is all that I have probably for today. So, welcome to the course and I hope it will be an enjoyable experience for all of you. Thank you.